1871, the Great Chicago Fire. The devastation spread over four miles and left more than 100,000 people homeless. It was a tragedy that, in many ways, defined the future for the village of Glenview. The rebuilding of Chicago created an enormous demand for housing, and that meant lumber from the north. During the months after the fire, train tracks sprang up between Chicago and Milwaukee. Glenview, having a station on the Chicago-Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad line, was poised for economic prosperity and population growth. Soon after the tracks were laid, the farmland north of Chicago would see great changes. This area was now accessible and a short commute from downtown. In 1892, the Swedenborg community purchased 40 acres on the northwest corner at the intersection of Shermer and Glenview Roads. The Swedenborgians were a close-knit group. They strongly believed in mutual cooperation and community service. Their design of a planned community, known as the park, had sections for homes, a park, a school, and a church, and would influence the future design of Glenview. These families also represented the first commuters who had businesses in Chicago but lived in the country. Less than 10 years after they arrived, the Swedenborgians played a significant role in the incorporation of the village. Mr. Hugh Burnham, a resident of the park and an attorney working in Chicago, led the referendum to incorporate the village in June of 1899. He eventually became the first village president of Glenview, which by now had an estimated population of 351 residents. By 1905, several large businesses had been established. The Lutter Brick Company, Rugen Stores, the Pearson Lumber Company, and Dilg's Tavern. Just a year earlier, Glenview School was built with an impressive second story and several classrooms. The village kept growing, and in 1910, 11 years since the village was incorporated, the population had nearly doubled, from 350 to 652. The rapid growth in population, businesses, the closeness of new houses, and perhaps the lingering memories of the Great Chicago Fire gave rise to a growing concern that a devastating fire could strike their community. The village residents felt they needed protection. John Dilg was an important business owner in Glenview. He owned Dilg's Tavern, which served up food and drink, housed travelers, and provided a meeting place for village businesses in the years before a civic building was constructed. It was here, in what is known today as the Glenview House, that in response to the residents' concern, the fire department was established at a village meeting on December 2nd, 1911. It began as a permanent volunteer staff consisting of 25 men led by John Dilg, and the first order of business was the purchase of fire equipment. At the August 1912 meeting, after considerable discussion, it was unanimously agreed upon to purchase a combination engine not to exceed $1,100. Efforts were made to procure this money, and donations were solicited and accepted from not only the members of the company, but from other citizens of the community as well. On September 7th, the sum of $755 was paid to the Howe Engine Company for a combination engine and a separate hose cart. This piece of apparatus was the pride of all the people of the village. The fire wagon delivered 100 gallons of water per minute to the fire and needed at least 16 men to operate. Those who at first thought it best to buy a second-hand and less expensive piece of equipment were convinced that the village was now amply protected. This first fire wagon was pulled by a team of horses. Usually that meant horse teams from Rugen Stores, the Lumber Yard, or Michael Sesterheim. When a team of horses was used, the owner received a $2 payment. But usually this money was not accepted because the owner did get the right and excitement of driving the fire pumper with his team of horses to the scene of the fire. In 1913, a bell was made for the purpose of sending out the alarm and to call the volunteer force to duty. This bell can still be found proudly displayed in front of the firehouse on Glenview Road. 
It was quite a scene to witness, with the bell ringing, the men running out of the businesses and storefronts, the team of horses hitched to the high wheel engine racing by, and crowds of people following the engine to a fire. Chris Sharp was one of those boys who, on bicycle, followed the excitement to the fire. Years later, some of these boys would become the firemen of the company, as Chris did in 1923. a volunteer for the fire service in 1914. Among the many regulations in their book, uh, section 7 specified any member giving an incorrect excuse for delinquencies or using insulting language to an officer or if he shall be guilty of any improper conduct rendering him an unfit associate he may be expelled from the company by a majority vote of all the members. Now remember, they're all volunteers. The next section says, sickness or death in the family of any member or absence from home shall be deemed sufficient excuse for any neglect of duty. We handled the fire calls. We would call Chief, uh, Chief Ladendorf to uh, oh, yes. find out if we should ring the siren, if he thought it was worth we should ring the siren. And then all the firemen would call. Oh, you rang the fire, the we, siren we from We rang the, the si oh, siren from I didn't the know uh, that. telephone company. And then um, the people would call in. The volunteer fire department would call in to find out where the fire, and they would take their vehicle and go to the fire. I remember they'd have to hurry up and put their boots exactly. on the rain, rain. And rain those were local businessmen, so they were yes. right there. I remember they would just drop everything, everything and run over to the fire station. I can remember that. It was Alex Borland, um, Carl Ladendor, all the business and the Rubens. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think remember. my uncle Ben Honeman was one of the original volunteers. Mm -hmm. Donald Long was one of those volunteers and was on call whenever there was an emergency. By the post-war period, the bell had been replaced by a siren. By the time Don joined the service in the early 1960s, the siren was used alongside portable one-way radio, the size of a bread box, and placed in a car. When I was a volunteer, uh, and even way after that, we were alerted by radio. And then if you were away from the house where you didn't have the radio, the sirens would also blow. And when you heard the siren, there was a special phone number that the firemen only knew. And they, you could call in and then find out what, the, what type of alarm it was and where it was. And then you could respond immediately. Because I always carried my fire gear in my car. So no matter where I was, I could respond and still at least have my fire gear. 1957, the Glenview Rural Association became a fire district. So then we got funds from taxes. Before that, it was strictly donations. Working as a fireman in the rural department was pretty risky since these men fought grass and crop fires, and that was often more dangerous than city building fires. In my volunteer days, as a, in nine years of volunteering, I think I went to more fires than I did the rest of my time as full-time. It was just an era, and, and we used to have a lot of grass fires. Remember now, there were a lot of open prairies then, so we'd go to a lot of grass fires. Well, we, we used to have what's called Indian tanks. It was five gallons of water you'd carry it on your back, because a lot of places you, you can't get an engine in there. You're way out someplace in that, so. Because I remember one time right over here on Rolly Meadow and the Prairie Lawn, between the two, well, Prairie Lawn wasn't there yet, it was, grass about this size, so John McCann and I were in there with Indian tanks, and all of a sudden the wind switched, and here we're completely surrounded by fire. And you know, the flames are about five feet high. And I'm thinking to myself, holy man. And, and all of a sudden, here comes one of the guys with the booster line from one of the engines, and you know, knock it out. Because grass fires you can knock out real easily with, with enough water, you know. Yeah. 
But that was, that was scary for, for a few seconds there. In 1965, the fire service in the village became paid staff. The transition to paid staff meant the fire department personnel could be properly trained to be more effective in life-saving and property-saving techniques. Don shared his years of firefighting experience in training new firemen. Going over the basics, the guys would complain, oh, we know all that stuff, yeah, but you screw up at the fires, so. But, you know, you gotta keep going, refreshing yourself with the basics, and you gotta keep doing it so that when you do things, you do them automatically, you don't have to think, because when there's a, a really working fire, I mean, you don't have time to think. You know, the first thing you're looking for is naturally is for rescuing people, if there's any people involved, and then, then you gotta get working at the fire then, so. In the 1970s, Don was the training officer at the rural department. At the time, I was, uh, actually I was appointed the training officer, and one of the things that I really remember in my, about 1972 or 1973, we started a, a fire school at the, at the station on Landwehr Road. And uh, so I uh, was, was first starting with the uh, fire Fire, fire, fire one, firefighter two classes, and we were just in the beginning of this, and this was run through the state fire marshal's office. And uh, so uh, we had about, I think the first class was about 15, you know, recruit firemen, and then I had to write up a test of 100 questions, which was a lot of work. I mean, I spent a lot of hours at night writing up these that questions. And uh, some of the guys went to paramedic school, and it wasn't as, many hours as it is now. And then we, we started running our ambulance, I believe it was 1974, started running the ambulance. Don became fire chief of the rural department in 1985. Glenview's continual expansion and population growth led to the absorption of the rural fire department into the main fire service. I was on the Glenview Rural Fire Department as a volunteer in 1961 I started and then in 1970 I became a full-time fireman and I was fire chief from 1985 till 1992 and then the two fire departments merged and then I retired in 1997. The 1970s also marked a change in the era of firefighting. The fire service learned probably in the late 60s, early 70s that um, fire prevention was, was critical. Um, in the early 70s was really uh, when, when fire in this country was, was out of control. I mean, there was so many fires, especially in the inner city type things. So we started learning early um, that if we could get out and, and, and teach people um, some prevention and, and smoke detectors and stop, drop, and roll and all those, that there would be benefit um, and it would cut down on the back end on, on fire calls and, and save money and lives and all those things. And the fire service learned very early that the way to get to the public was through the kids and is to go to the schools, talk to the kids, get involved there. The kids would then be our conduit to their parents. They would bring home information and said, well, the firemen said we have to do this and the firemen said we have to do that and get that information sent home through the schools. In the 1970s, when paramedic training was first introduced, paramedic training was essentially a fast taxi service that shuttled the patient to the nearest hospital where they would receive medical attention. Now the paramedics have become the first point of medical care and treatment where a patient's condition is stabilized. The paramedic program now has expanded so much. Um, the original SOPs or the standard operating procedures when the paramedics came on were only a few pages thick. Now they're a couple hundred pages thick. And the treatments that, that happen when earlier it was more of a get to the scene quickly, scoop up the patient and get to the hospital quickly. Um, over time, that's kind of, we still get to the scene quickly, um, but they do a lot more treatment on the scene. Um, there's a lot more drug protocol. The paramedics are, are much better trained in various illnesses and treatments, and so it gives that patient that heads up and, and the ability that the, the ER doc is getting drugs on board and treatment on board before the patient even arrives. This has tremendously reduced deaths and further injury to patients in distress. 
When I started, I think we did about 2,500 calls a year. Um, now we're up to over 7,000 calls a year. So I think just that difference in, in, in how busy we are, uh, we see a lot of change in the village as far as uh, in that time, suddenly assisted living facilities came to be. We didn't have that before. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of elderly residents now in, in somewhat, you know, uh, multi-family situations, condo buildings and things, that's grown a lot and that's been a lot of the impact on our calls that we didn't have before. I know we average about 19 to 21 calls a day so you know you, you can do the math from there. Um, we're about 60 percent, 65 percent are EMS calls, ambulance calls, um, the rest are fire calls. Technology and equipment have also made firefighting safer. Um, all of our fire apparatuses are on the street have computers in them, um, so they're connected into the database for the village, so they can see pre-plans, they can see water systems, um, photographs, anything they need is now at our fingertips. We're still refining it, uh, but the technology has been huge. That's probably been some of our, our best uh, things that we've done. So we kind of in the last 10 years have streamlined that and started coming up with uh, uh, more of a standard piece of equipment with five stations, uh, 81 shift personnel. It's kind of important that they all are familiar with the same thing and, and that wasn't always the case. So we kind of uh, worked through it and we've come up with what we think is probably the best apparatus, especially for this community and we just kind of Every year there has to be some updates and some minor things, but generally we try to keep, you know, the pump panels, the driver's uh, compartment, everything about the same so that if you're used to switches being here on this rig, the switches are going to be there on the next rig because I think that it, it helps with safety, you know, whereas before it was in the back of our mind, now it's regulated a lot more. We have to have a certain number of people to go in and attack a fire, certain number of equipment you have to have you know, all the standard, you know, all mandated, you know, from what we wear now, we're fully protected, fully covered. Uh, all of those things have changed and, and all the regulations associated with it. So that's changed. I think a lot of the uh, ordinances and, and uh, regulations for fire prevention have changed, how buildings are built, uh, what's required in them. I, we just talked about fire alarms are required now, whereas before um, they weren't. So now we're getting the calls earlier um, and hopefully before the fire gets, you know, out of control. Uh, each of our rigs has a thermal imager camera now, which wasn't in existence when I started. And, and guys can look in and see an infrared image as they're searching, you know, for a victim because you can't see through smoke and, and those things. The camera can. So you start seeing body heat and those things. You can see footsteps. Um, so that helps a great deal in keeping our guys safe but also getting in quicker and, and finding victims and, and those things. So technology obviously has been a big help for us. You know, air packs last longer, they're safer, they're better. Um, the rigs themselves were able to carry more equipment, more water, um, things like that. That's basically our toolbox, so we need to get it at the scene of the fire. So we're able to have more, more equipment on a single piece and then we don't need two pieces, basically. So a lot of changes but still basically the same principle. You still need to get inside that building and put that fire out. The most recent large-scale operation involving the fire department was the plane crash in 2010. I've dealt with a couple plane crashes. Those are always different and very serious. One was a year and a half ago out in the, on the west side of town uh, up, uh, in the Forest Preserve. We had a, a, a Learjet type craft go down that was going into Powaukee Airport. Um, there were a pilot and a co-pilot lost their lives on that one. Dispatchers played a vital role in helping to locate the wreck and the victims. Uh, we had a, uh, a report uh, from the Pawaki or Chicago Executive Airport Tower reporting that a plane had gone down on approach. Uh, Glenview dispatched um, apparatus to what we thought was a plane crash that occurred in outside of our jurisdiction that occurred in Prospect Heights. We were able to uh, coordinate a response of surrounding agencies um, while searching for this plane. Um, it ended up being located in Glenview. 
uh, and through the ability of, of phone calls uh, between the agencies, but also the radio communication, inter, um, interoperability communication between police and fire and talking with uh, the, the, the television stations that had helicopters up in the air at the time. We were able to coordinate uh, the, the locating the plane. Uh, unfortunately, um, there, there was no rescue involved um, due to the severity of the crash, but there was a, a good teamwork as far as working with dispatch centers from multiple jurisdictions. Emergency dispatcher training has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. The 911 industry has, uh, has gone from originally being a clerical type position where somebody answered the phone and uh, talked on the radio to tell police or fire where they should uh, re be responding. Uh, now telecommunications, 911 telecommunicators is now a, 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 f a true first responder. We're a profession that requires um, much more training than just being able to type into the computer or answer a phone started in Glenview in 1983 as a police dispatcher only and then a few years ago we switched over to doing police and fire dispatching. 911, where's your emergency? We, we all get ex excellent and intensive training to do this job, both, both the police and the fire aspect of it. Uh, our dispatchers here in, in Glenview are EMD certified so they go through uh, 40 hours of EMD certification training to be an EMD dispatcher. Uh, EMD is emergency medical dispatching mm -hmm. and EMD uh, allows us to provide medical uh, advice or guidance to a caller prior to uh, the fire department and ambulance responding on the scene. Currently we run uh, four telecommunicators uh, from 6 a.m. until midnight and three from midnight till 6 a.m. In my career, no two days have ever been alike. Um, it could be very busy at 6 a.m. It could be very quiet. It could be busy at 2 p.m. It just depends on, a lot has to do with the weather, if, there, if it's winter time, if it's summer, if it's a holiday, if there's a lot of people out, if there's not many people out, I mean, it, it all depends. But uh, we get anything from lockouts to call for service to you know, ambulance requests, a car accident. Sometimes you get frantic callers where you can't, you know, you don't understand what they're trying to tell you. You need to calm them down first find out where you need to go, what needs to be sent, stuff like that. Um, there is no real typical call. Every, just about everything and anything can come in here. Over the last century, the fire service has changed dramatically, from a grassroots volunteer organization that provided service only when needed, to the modern day highly specialized workforce of professionals that operate specialized equipment provide life-saving treatments and continually educate the public to minimize injuries and prevent deaths. Firefighting has also become much more a collaborative effort between municipalities, counties, states, and national response teams. We do cooperate with, with our neighbors. Um, in this area we have what's called MABUS, which is the Mutual, Arm, Mutual Aid Box Alarm System, which is kind of a co-op of all the neighborhood departments. Um, it's statewide, it's actually regional, there's more than just this state, but it's divided into divisions. Uh, our division is Division 3, which includes all of our neighbors. There's 18 or 19 towns that are involved in that. And how we cooperate is, is you know, no one town has all the resources to handle everything that comes up. We all have bits and pieces. So on the first level, any fire that comes in, you know, even with five stations, we can probably handle that first initial fire, but there's other calls. If the fire grows beyond where uh, our resources can handle, we need help. Um, and, and, you know, and how long is this fire going to go on? So automatically we get mutual aid coming from our neighbors on the initial call. So if we have a fire in Glenview and we're going to need some help, Northbrook will send an engine or Niles will send an ambulance or a truck or whatever the case may be. So all this is set up in advance and in turn we're going to their communities when they have incidences. The most valuable tradition passed down from the firefighters of a hundred years ago to the firefighters hired in 2011 is answering that call to emergency service. What was the most enjoyable time on the fire department? I says when I was on the engine company. It was. 
If Dave, you can say that's enjoyable going to fires and that, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd have to actually say going on the calls and getting out in the public, because uh, then you get to get out and really do your job and be out there and help the help the public. And yes, no, it's a it's a great feeling and it's great to be able to go out and give them the help that they need. I think if you'd ask 99% of firefighters, they'd say they, they really enjoy the, the firefighting, fire suppression aspect of uh, our profession, but uh, I, I know for myself being a newer uh, paramedic, I do thoroughly enjoy the, uh, the EMS portion because that is a, a large percentage of our calls and it's good to get, like he said, out in the community and help them out any way we can. The people of Glenview are very fortunate to have the fire service that we have today. We began with a, fi a volunteer fire company that was uh, putting the welfare of the community well above their own. They put their own businesses on hold while they went off to answer a fire call. Who knows how many lives they've saved over the years, but I'm sure that all of us are very, very grateful that they continue, even today, to put the welfare of all of us above their own. Most of it I still enjoy the most is, is serving the public and helping people. Um, even at my level where I'm not on the street as much as I used to, uh, I'm still involved in it and, and I still know what goes on and, and I know that when that alarm goes off somebody is having probably the worst day of their life and knowing that our folks are going there to help them, um, I think that's the most rewarding. When you get to do that and, and say, you know what, we can help you with this, let me take care of this and then it is taken care of and seeing you know, how much they appreciate that, I still think is probably the best part of the job. Is, is That's what we're all here for, is to serve the public. So when you actually get to do that, I think that's probably the most rewarding part.